Okay, so a pretty significant lesson today. We're going to start talking about about the inverse ring functions. And before we start talking about that, we'll look at um, some review, or probably review, but maybe new stuff, you know, about inverses in general. So as a reminder, two functions are inverses if they undo each other in the following sense. If you take one and you stick it inside the other, the functions totally cancel and you're just left with x. So a classic example, f of x equals x cubed, g of x equals the cubed root of x. These are inverses because both of these conditions are satisfied. F of g of x is the cubed root of x cubed. And the cubed root and the cube cancel out, and you just get x. g of f of x is the cubed root of x cubed. And again, the cubed root and the cube cancel out. The cubed root of x cubed is x. So what are inverses for? Well, uh, kind of open-ended question, but one answer would be that you can use inverses to solve equations. Let me pause for a second and get our calculator loading up. So say you have the equation x cubed equals seven. We discussed just a few minutes ago that x cubed and the cubed root of x are inverses. And what that means in relation to this is that if you take the cubed root of both sides, on the left, the cubed root and the cube cancel, and you get x is the cubed root of 7. And then you can go to your calculator and you can ask your calculator, what is the cubed root of seven? And your calculator will tell you. 
about 1.91. So having this inverse of x cubed allowed us to solve for x. Let's now imagine the following problem. You're creating a um a rank for a um, building, a wheelchair ramp. And the ramp you're thinking about looks like this. It's 12 feet long and one foot high. So the ramp you're thinking of building looks like the hypotenuse of this triangle. Well, the Americans with Disability Act tells you um, that there is a maximum value that angle theta can take. If theta is too big, the wheelchair won't go up the ramp easily. So here's a situation where you know the sides of a triangle and you'd like to know what is a theta. Um, in particular, you know the opposite side and the adjacent. So you can't get theta from that, but you can get what trig function? Oh, tangent. The tangent is exactly correct, thank you. The tangent of theta is one over 12. So we need to be able to solve an equation that looks like this. And if the tangent had an inverse, that would give us a path forward, just like, just like here, where we got rid of the cubed with the cubed root. If the tangent had an inverse, you could take the inverse of both sides. On the left, the tangent and its inverse would cancel out. And you'd find that theta is the inverse of the tangent of one twelfth. And then just like before, we would go to our calculator and we would locate the inverse of the tangent button or menu option or whatever, and we'd have our calculator take it for us. Well, this is basically what we are going to do, but there's a slight hitch that we have to overcome. And when I say what the hitch is, it's probably not going to sound slight. It's probably going to sound absolutely fatal. None of the six trig functions 
path in verses. Not every trade function, not every function does have an inverse, and none of the trig functions do. Again, thinking back to maybe algebra or wherever you might have seen this material before, um, we'll just give kind of the informal argument, or not informal, I guess, definition. A function is called one to one if f of a equaling f of b means that A and B are actually the same number. And then no periodic function can be one, two, one. Now, the sine of zero equals the sine of two pi, but zero does not equal two pi. The tangent of pi over four equals the tangent of five pi over four. But pi over four does not equal five pi over four. And so on with all six of the trig functions. And that's a problem because only one to one functions have in versus. And that's because, um, you know, look at the sign. The sign of zero is zero. The sign of two pi is also zero. What an inverse does in terms of a picture like this is that inverse should reverse the arrows. Inverse, reverse. So zero should go to zero if, if this inverse sign exists. It will send zero to zero. But if this inverse sign exists, it should also send zero to two pi. Well, which is it? It has to be one or the other. A function isn't allowed to send zero to multiple numbers. So where we're in an impossible situation. An inverse can't exist. So now what? Because 
I said that these things don't have inverses, but also we need them too. We need to be able to solve an equation that looks like this. Um, and to do that, we need an inverse. Well, there's a trick here, and it's kind of a cute trick, I guess. Um, Let's go to desmos.com. And let's look at, well, let's start with the sign. So one way of seeing graphically that the sign is not one-to-one is called the horizontal line test. And the horizontal line test says, well, draw a horizontal line. And if it's possible to draw a horizontal line that hits the curve more than once, this function is not one-to-one. And the reason this works, I mean, look at this point, negative 5.978 comma 0.3. That is telling you that negative 5.978 is being sent by the sign to 0 0.3. And now let's look at another point on this horizontal line, negative 3.446 comma 3. The sign is also sending that to 0 0.3. And then the exact same issue we have here, that if an inverse existed, it would have to send 0.3 to negative 5.978. And it would have to send 0.3 to negative 3.446. And that is not possible. So here's the idea. Here's what we're going to do. This sign doesn't have an in. We can see that this horizontal line hits it a bunch of times. But if we didn't look at the entire sine function, though, what if we only looked at the part of the sine function between negative pi over two to positive pi over two. Well, now that we don't have the entire sine function, suddenly this graph does have an inverse. This horizontal line is only hitting it once. So what we're going to do with all of the trig functions our method is to restrict the trig functions to 
some interval where they are one o one and then we define the inverses of these restricted functions. And we call these the inverse Craig functions. And we, we call them the inverse trig functions, but again, it's a, it's a lie. The, the sine of x, this trig function, doesn't have an inverse. So we're, um, when we talk about the inverse of the sine, we're not actually talking about the inverse of the sine. We're talking about the inverse of this little function that looks like the sine, but is only defined on this interval. And for each of the six trig functions, maybe with the secant, you sometimes see some disagreement, but by and large, for each of the six trig functions, there's a standard restriction that we use. I mean, negative pi over two to positive pi over two is not the only interval I could have selected. It's just that via convention, there are these intervals that we always use. And it's come on to smoke work with me here. So let's talk about these one by one. And let's try to get a firm understanding of what we can actually do with these inverse trig functions. So in this section, we'll look at the inverse sine, the inverse cosine, the inverse tangent. I don't know if the book um, ever talks about the other inverse trig functions. But notice that if you want to solve like the secant of x equals 1.17, well, that's one divided by the cosine of x is 1.17. 1 equals 1.17 times the cosine of x. 1 divided by 1.17 is the cosine of x. And then, let's see, 1 divided by 1.17, this horrible uh, one divided by 1.17, this horrible looking decimal, we could, would probably look a little nicer as a fraction, 100 over 117. But in any rate, notice that an equation involving the secant, 
could be rewritten as an equation involving the cosine, and that's our justification for only looking at the sine, the cosine, and the tangent. For the others, we can rewrite the equation like we do here. So there are, for the inverse sine, and likewise for the other two inverse trig functions we're looking at in this textbook section, there are two standard pieces of notation, although one of them is admittedly pretty old-fashioned at this point. Um, we could write sine x with a negative one up there. Or we could write arc sine x. And arc sine x is kind of old fashioned, but it, it's what I grew up with. It's what I always use. So you can write whatever notation you want on the homework or on the tests. These are two different ways of writing the same thing. Um, R sign. Why the arc sign? Well, because if you're on a unit circle and you're measuring your angle in radians, asking what this angle x is, is the same as asking for the length of that Arc line segment, the length of that arc, I should say. Um, the way radians are defined, the angle and the arc are the same. So it's probably most of the time we think that we're trying to find the angle, but you could think that we're trying to find the arc as well. It's the same thing. And, you know, we'll talk about the inverse sign a little specifically, but for the other trig functions, we have precisely the same um, options. The inverse cosine can be written as cos, then a negative one in the superscript x, or it can be written arc cos. The inverse tangent can be written tan negative one x or arc tan x. And although this section of the textbook doesn't talk about them, the secant, cosecant, and cotangent also have this notation. So let's look specifically at the arc sign for the moment. The arc sign or the inverse sign or however you want to call it. So this is the inverse of the sign, but it's the inverse of the sign, not the entire thing, but the sign on some little interval. So if we didn't have that caveat, 
Then the arc sine and the sine being inverses. would give you the following statements, that the arc sine of the sine of x is x, or that the sine of the arc sine of x is x. Um, th again, that's composition. I think a kind of common error is to see the parentheses, and we're so used to using parentheses when we want to multiply that students sometimes get a little confused, but this is composition. We've got one function stuck inside the other. And what I have on the board is what would be true if the arc sine and the sine were genuine the inverses, because they aren't. This first statement has a caveat. That's actually not true for most X values. It's only true if X is stuck between negative pi over two and positive pi over two. So the way most, you know, most textbooks, for example, write this, they'll say this first statement has this caveat, which is true, it definitely does, and it's an important caveat. And then they'll say, well, the second statement also has a caveat, it's only true if X is between negative one and one. And that's sort of like, yeah, I mean, that's true, but the reason that's true, let's go to Desmos and let's take a look at the arc sign. I mean, the arc sign is only defined for values of x between negative one and positive one. So these caveats always sort of get treated by textbooks as if they're equivalent, and they're really not. The second caveat is just telling you, well, X needs to be defined. I mean, the arc sine of X needs to be defined because we're taking the arc sine of X here. If we're talking about the arc sine of X, we need to be in this interval. Otherwise, we don't even have this and it doesn't make sense to talk about. So, I mean, it's kind of a trivial restriction in that sense compared to this restriction where the sign is perfectly well-defined for every value of X, but the statement is only true if X is in this interval. So something I think sometimes gets lost in the shuffle, and it might seem like I'm criticizing our textbook a lot, but I think basically, I mean, all trig textbooks are basically identical. Something that I think gets lost in the shuffle is what this means on a practical level. Like say that we have an equation we want solve. The sine of x equals 0 0.7. And we ask, well, now that we have this not quite, but sort of inverse, can we solve this equation? 
And the answer is sort of. Not quite, but sort of. We can take the arc sign of both sides of this equation. And on the left, you have something awkward. You have the arc sign of the sine of x. And you know that's equal to x, but only sometimes. So this is equal to x, but x has to be between negative pi over two and positive pi over two. And then the arc sine of 0 0.7 is just some number. I'll show you in a moment where it is on the calculator. Let me, by the way, let me double check that I'm yep, still in radian mode. So the calculator uses the sine inverse notation. And even from where you're sitting, I don't know if you can really see this, but um, you see the sign button is here. And then the sign inverse, the arc sign is above it in blue. So the way our calculator works, our calculator is color coded because this arc sign is in blue. First we press the blue button, the second button, and then we press the sign button and we'll get the thing in blue above the sign button, which is the arc sign. The arc sign of 0.7 is 0 0.775. So, have we solved this equation? I mean, it certainly looks like we solved this equation. We've got an, an answer, but the real answer is that we've partially solved the equation. Let's go back to Desmos. Here is the sign of x, we want to know when the sine of x is equal to 0 0.7. Well, what we see is that the sine of x is equal to 0 0.7 in an infinite number of places. We have found exactly one of these solutions. We found this 0 0.775. In particular, I mean, remembering the restriction we put on the sign. We found the solution that's in this restricted interval. And this interval, this restriction was chosen so that if there is a solution, there will be one and only one solution in this interval. 
So kind of the takeaway from that, we can use the inverse trig functions to solve equations involving the sine, the cosine, the tangent. When we do, we'll get one solution. Really, there are infinitely many solutions. In probably most situations, the solution we'll get is the solution we want. But if we need a different solution, there are ways of taking this solution and getting the other solution. So we'll put that in the back burner for now. We'll talk about it, I think, in chapter nine, maybe. We're in chapter eight now. But yeah, we can use the inverse trig functions to solve equations. We just need to bear in mind that we're getting one solution, and that solution might or might not be the solution that we need. So for the other trig functions, I mean, they work in the same way. So maybe I'll go a little faster. So one sort of downside, the curse of this material is that every inverse trig function has its own restriction. So we restricted the sine to one interval, we restrict the cosine to another interval. And then we define the arc cosine and the arc cosine of the cosine of x equals x and the cosine of the arc cosine of x equals x. And this first equality, though, has an important caveat. It's only true if x is between 0 and pi. This second equality has a less important caveat. And the reason, again, that I say it's less important is this caveat's really just saying if the arc cosine is defined. And then, just like with the sine, you can use the arc cosine to solve equations. But the solutions you get are going to be in this interval, like somewhere that we try to find it. Somewhere way back. Uh, maybe I'm totally hallucinating, or maybe. I um, accidentally deleted the frame I want. Yeah, I thought that some, I mean, somewhere I asked a question about the secant and ended up with an equation involving the cosine, but it looks like I deleted that. Um, We'll spend Friday on this material. We can talk more about secants then. Let's just do a very quick and very elementary example. The cosine of x is one seventh. Take the arc cosine of both sides, 
on the left, we'll have x. And the value of x we'll get is going to be between 0 and pi. On the right, the arc cosine of 1 seventh. It's right above the cosine, again, color-coded. So 1.427. And again, in, in actuality, the cosine of x equals one seventh has an infinite number of solutions. We're just getting the uh, solution between zero and pi. The tangent, so the, res the tangent is almost the same restriction as the sine except that we're not including the endpoints. And that's just because the tangent isn't defined at those endpoints. And our pattern repeats. So this is a little different. I mean, you still see textbooks act as if there is a restriction here, except that the arc tangent is defined everywhere. So instead of having an actual restriction, we say, well, if x is a number, if x is between negative infinity and positive infinity. Going back to our wheelchair ramp. Theta is the arc tangent of one twelve. Arctangent of one twelfth is hiding above arctangent, I should say, is hiding above the tangent, not one half, one divided by twelve, zero point zero eight three radians. And um, I said earlier, you know, that in most real world situations, or a lot of them anyway, you're only going to really be interested in one solution, and it's going to be the one you want. I mean, this is the only angle, the only solution to the tangent of theta equals one twelfth that makes any sense for a for a um, wheelchair ramp. I mean, the other solutions are going to be negative or they're going to be greater than pi radians, greater than 180 degrees. None of those make sense. Only the one we got makes sense. And I will continue this material Friday. I'll record it and post it.